three, two, one. Good morning and welcome to your Tuesday edition of the Morning Jog. My name is Matt Cohan and I am joined today by the enviable Francis Ellis and Robbie Berger. Francis looks to be on a boat somewhere mm -hmm. in Maine. Nope, just, just in a screened-in porch, a sip, as I like to call it. I didn't know if you were going to say boat or a bender, because it actually kind of looks like Francis is coming off a little bit of a bender as well. Hey, no, <laughs> I'm, I'm not a huge drinker. <laughs> you have to be mistaken with somebody. Uh, Robbie, you look to be in, in some hotel room in Idaho or something. What, what kind of Care painting is that? Careful what you say, Matty, guys, because we all know who the one really coming off a bender is. <laughs> That's right. That right now. <laughs> Let's I'm move so on to our first story, <laughs> All right. First story involves some baseball. Something's hot right now. ESPN released the new 30 for 30, Maguire and Sosa home run race in 98 that premiered on Sunday. And the bizarre story surrounding Maguire's 70th home run ball is making the rounds again. Phil Ozerski was the fan who caught Maguire's 70th home run ball on September 28, 1998. The Cardinals offered him a signed bat, ball, and a jersey in exchange for the historic souvenir but he decided to hold out and ask for one more sweetener to meet Mr. McGuire. Quote, I was really adamant about just wanting to meet the guy. And they were like, the Cardinals and McGuire don't negotiate. He told the East Bay Times in 2007. It was pretty testy and they basically made the decision for me. Big Mac told him to piss off and three months later, he sold the ball for three million to Todd McFarlane, the creative Spawn comic book, taking home 2.7 million after a 300,000 auction commission. At the time, Ozerski was a 26-year-old genetic researcher making just $30,000 a year. Francis, how baffling is this move by McGuire? You know, I don't really understand it. So I'm going to have some questions for you, if that's all right, Matt. Um, my, my first question is, you know, why, why would McGuire not meet with him? That is something I don't have. The, McGuire was like, he, he hated the media. He hated all the media attention. Like that, I remember that was like a big narrative surrounding it. But I, I, was, I was searching for that in multiple different sites. I could not find a valuable answer for you. So the team wanted the ball for historical purposes. All Ozerski wanted was to meet Mark McGuire in addition to the, the, some signed bullshit. And when McGuire refused, that was the end of the deal. Like that spiked it. Couldn't, couldn't the team have offered, well, we can't, we, Mark won't meet you, but why don't we give you season tickets for a year? I mean, well, it just seems strange to me that that's, that would be the end of the road in that negotiation. Yeah. And he, he even said, he was like, if I just got in a room with him and I saw big lumbering Mark McGuire there, he would have been like, I would have gave the ball right up. So there's more to the story here. Maybe they'll cover it in yeah. the documentary, but um seems like this could be all avoided with just a little shake of the hand here. it's it's something that is so simple to just meet the guy i remember when Derek jeter got his three thousand said he did a media tour with the guy i think he flew the fucking guy to the bahamas yeah. mark mcguire can't shake this guy's hand. look i never really liked mike mcguire because he cheated the game and all that but i didn't strongly dislike the guy i strongly dislike the guy now i strongly dislike the st louis cardinals too this this ball is worth 3.8 million dollars now that guy's probably worth more than mark mcguire is and all you can offer the guy is a a, a bat a signed ball and all that bullshit go meet the guy and, and talk to him get the ball which makes me think maybe this is too bizarre but makes me think maybe Mark McGuire knew that he was cheating so much that the ball shouldn't be worth anything. And this is why he didn't want to meet the guy. Shame on Mark it, McGuire. What, it, a, what a prick. It is, it is really weird because you, you have to figure that like the Cardinals would have set up that meeting so that it was so convenient for Mark McGuire. Maybe yes. he, he goes to do some weightlifting one day and on the way out, he's got a five minute BS conversation with, this guy in exchange for the, the ball. And look, I don't mean to like, I don't mean to pull like a, a fame card or whatever, but I, I, I've, I've had to like meet people and shake hands and take pictures before, usually after like a comedy club uh, performance, right? And I've had like 200 people waiting, waiting to say hi. It takes 45 minutes to get through that many people. And you just suck it up. It's it's not that bad. You just say hi to everyone. How are you? Where are you from? Thanks for coming. That's all Mark McGuire had to do, and he couldn't do it. 
It makes me think he's a sociopath. Instead of meeting with the media for a half hour after the game, you meet with this guy for five to ten minutes, or you meet with the media for 30 minutes, and then you meet with this guy for 10 more. Fuck Mark McGuire. Sorry, but fuck him. Fuck yeah. Mark McGuire. And for um, reference here, so – Ken Griffey Jr., one of his, like, ball, I don't know, 65 home runs or something, the fan willingly gave him back, and all he got was, like, a signed jersey and a trip to the All-Star game. So that dude has got to be – I mean, he could still be spending that money. This guy, Ozerski, to his credit, gave $250,000 to, like, charity. So he's been doing well by it. So good for him. Yeah, I mean, that's a mistake, though. Like, not, <laughs> not, not to say that it's a mistake about charity, but, I mean, dude, this guy, you said 2.7 after – he gave up the the auction fee, which after taxes is like one point nine. Frick, one point <laughs> nine. He's, he's making thirty thousand a year. I mean, come on, dude. Like, be I know. Stupid. Don't give up uh, a twenty percent of your wealth. To I know. All those even, all those children he saved. What an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, fellas. Moving on. Speaking of moonshots, during last week's Charles Schaub challenge. Colin Montgomery told the BBC that the PGA Tour should switch to a ball that goes 80 to 85% as far as the top of the line balls the players are currently using. Quote, I'm an advocate of what Jack Nicholas proposes, a tournament ball for professionals that goes 80 to 85% as far. Montgomery, a top European golfer in the 1990s and 2000s, told the outlet, quote, the time has come, but we can't be building courses at 10,000 yards. Montgomery spe specifically singled out Bryson DeChambeau, who said he bulked up to 45 pounds in the past nine months and is hitting 340 off the tee. Quote, the transformation has been amazing. I could not believe what I saw when I switched on in the first round. Even Bryson's XL shirts are looking tight right now. Bryson played Dustin Johnson the first two days, and he was giving him 25 yards off the tee. And Dustin is no slouch. He's huge. Quote, it's great to see the athleticism in the game, but to see him carrying 330 yards in the air and with the bounce, you're up to 350, 360. This is getting unreal. Robbie, you're shaking your head. What's your, what's your take on this? I mean, that's what it was. It was unreal. I actually, I thought I was doing a really smart thing before this tournament. I took Bryson DeChambeau to win the whole thing, plus 500, 100 to win $500. And this was the exact reason for it. Look, he adjusted to the game. I, I mean, what, what do you – how could you be upset at the guy for this? He's hitting moonshots. Yeah. And it's just – if you want to hit moonshots, hit the gym, do what Bryson DeChambeau did. Rory McIlroy is a skinny guy, and he's still hitting the ball 330, you know, some odd yards. But adjust to the game. He worked all offseason for it. He's a nut mentally as far as his preparation and all that. You can't get a set of uh, DeChambeau. And like this guy said, you really can't change the courses. Adjust to the game. And and with that being said, yeah, he could hit it this far. It gives him a huge advantage. He still has got to hit the short stuff. And the reason I didn't cash in my bet was because he didn't hit the short stuff. So there's nothing you could do for that. Hmm. Francis? Yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, and Rory McIlroy is, is, is a great person to bring up because Rory, Rory McIlroy is uh, five foot nine. 161 pounds and he is third in average driving distance behind Bryson who is first obviously but only by an average of four yards okay right. if those two if Rory's hitting four yards behind Bryson they're still probably hitting the same club into the green and it it, it to me is just such an obvious uh counter argument to to Montgomery's old man bullshit of bulk equals advantage on tour it doesn't right. adding you know 45 pounds to your bench max is not going to help you scramble out of bunkers around the green it's not going to help you see lines on putts um this to me is just another example of like an, a, an old guy who played a, who played a sport in a different era complaining about how the current crop of athletes has found a way to dominate it in a different way if you talk about like in the nba Remember a couple of years ago, everyone was complaining that Steph Curry was hitting threes so easily they needed to move yeah. the three-point line back. Uh, it, or, or saying, you know, uh, uh, that, that they might need to raise the rim because guys are dunking too easily. I mean, maybe that hasn't been brought up. But, like, we have seen athletes become stronger, faster, smarter as a result of technology, yes, but also just as a result of training techniques and understanding of the game. 
This is finally catching up to golf, which is the sport that is notorious for being the most resistant to change and adaptation. And I would say, hey, Colin, if you're worried about driving distance and guys getting too strong, maybe address the fact that there are certain golf courses that still don't allow women before we tackle this kind of shit, okay? Ooh, Francis on a heater. Felt on like Stephen absolute a. Cut that heater up into a little out. clip, fellas. Wow, I feel like we're on first take. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I have nothing to add there, so I'm going to fucking move on to the third and final story. And, Robbie, I don't want you to get PTSD here, but we're, gonna, we're going back to the classroom. Yeah, let's bring it back. Sometimes you got to revisit the roots. <laughs> the University of Kentucky is offering an adulting 101 course that will be offered online this summer and is geared towards teenagers who are getting ready to leave home for the real world. The course will consist of topics like mental and physical health, time management skills, roommate etiquette, personal safety in online spaces, resume and job search skills, basic nutrition and cooking, and budgeting and money management. The course begins June 16th and lasts for eight weeks. It costs just $29.99. Robbie, do you think your college career would have still ended unceremoniously if this was on the menu? Look, I'm looking at some of these classes right now. A couple, I could see some struggles. I think I would have had like a 3-4 GPA. <laughs> Here's where it, what I first thought of, and for better or for worse, what I thought about when I saw this Kentucky course is I think Kentucky, I think John Calipari, I think basketball. Now, you're John Calipari, and you're trying to get a recruit over somebody like a Mike Krzyzewski over at Duke, okay? And the recruit is in the middle. He doesn't know which way he's going to go. Do you know why he's going to go Kentucky? Because instead of going to Duke where he's going to have to do trigonometry and calculus and all that stuff that Francis probably did in the sixth or seventh grade and deal with all of that stuff, you're going to be able to go to Kentucky and you're going to be able to take a get your mind right class. I mean, all these different classes, it's a breeze. Advantage Kentucky. I got Kentucky going dancing into the tournament at least the final four next year with this new curriculum. Woo! First, yeah. how's that for a take, fellas? How's yeah. that for a take? First. Boys are coming in. Boys are coming in hot for a Monday today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's let the Harvard man speak, okay? Drop out. <laughs> I, 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 I totally agree with this too. I, I remember hearing that Matt Leinert and his girlfriend were taking ballroom dancing at USC. We've heard so many stories about college athletes taking these sham classes. If they're going to take sham classes anyway, they might as well take some classes that teach them valuable skills do you know how great it would have been if i'd had some class my senior year that taught me the correct questions to ask a real estate broker before finding my first rental in new york city like hey how what's the square footage like when was the last time somebody died here i don't know so we, we've talked so many times this comes up all the time of like i don't know why i'm taking you know uh, Robert Louis Stevenson and the, the written word or whatever, some bullshit liberal arts class. And people want these much more uh, applicable, practical life skill classes. This is the chance to do that. Um, taxes and how to do your taxes or maybe carpentry, whatever it may be. I, 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 these things would be great for athletes because I think that they'd be more interested in the material, but I don't know. Uh, than if they were forced to read, you know, the most dangerous game for the 45th time. So right. um, I like this move. Uh, I think there's a way to make it interesting and challenging and fit within a college curriculum. And um, good for good for the University of Kentucky. And yeah, good for was, the morning job. Yeah. It was that, kind of I mean, a good episode today. It's a good episode. I'll end it with something pretty embarrassing. But the first, contrary to the first time I got my uh, – credit card the first credit card i got i didn't know that you had to pay interest on the money i thought yeah. you could just t take the money and pay it back at the end of the year and then i'm hit with this my my balance keeps going up i'm like what the fuck i mean that would have been nice for someone just to say you know you hey. know what it's funny but it, in all honesty a credit card class is something that can yeah. really help over yeah. a history or, or some some yeah. type of class i'm with you maddie ice thanks yeah. buddy yeah. All right, let's end it there, fellas. This was good. You guys both came with your A game today. Hopefully we can do better tomorrow and keep this train going. That was right, your let's... Tuesday edition of the morning jog. We will see you guys same time, same place tomorrow. Like and subscribe. Love you. Good stuff.